Great. Well, firstly, thank you so much, Patrick, for taking the time to come and join us this morning. It's always an absolute pleasure to chat. So lovely to be able to do it in this forum. And, and just for everyone's uh, sort of information, so Patrick is the CEO of the Sustainable Food Trust, um, is currently farming in Wales and has been doing so for quite some time, which I'm sure Patrick will tell us about as we get going. And really, Patrick is pushing the agenda forward on how we measure on-farm sustainability, which is a hugely topical conversation, given we have elms and everything that's going on at the moment. So, Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Well, thank you for having me. Well, it's a real pleasure. And, and so, Patrick, as always, the way we start this is um, it's amazing to get to understand kind of your journey to date. So I just thought, you know, would you be able to share with us, you know, how you got into farming in the first place? You know the journey up until today what and then what you're working on at the moment and really what would be great to understand is your vision for the future so yeah over to you well i don't know where to start really but uh, if i'll just maybe i should just start with talking about a few um influences uh because i am if if i'm sort of honest i'm a bit of a, an old hippie really <laughs> and uh, last night on um, world service uh I, as some people do, probably older than a certain age, you tend to listen to, you know, when Radio 4 sort of gives way to world service in the, during the night. And uh, I think it might have been about three o'clock this morning. I happened to turn it on, as one does. And Alice Waters uh, of Chez Panisse Restaurant uh, had a whole programme. It's called, what's it called? The Food Chain. It's one of these world service programmes. And Alice Waters is the founder of Chez Panisse Restaurant, which is probably one of the most famous restaurants in America. And weirdly enough, we're doing a podcast, I'm doing a podcast with her today. So there she was talking on um, World Service and I, it was just quite strange. And the really interesting thing about Alice is that Alice's restaurant, you know, the same as the Arlo Guthrie song, which no one will know about because they're just too young, is that um, it was, she founded it in 1971. And when she founded it, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area because my father was a visiting professor at Stanford University. So I went out there with the family and I was in California for a year. And I would say that the atmosphere of that time, particularly in the Bay Area, was conducive to the arising of new thoughts and impulses. And um, a lot of the seeds of what took me back to the land from a London childhood were planted during the 60s. And again, coincidentally, I was a huge fan of the Incredible String Band, which no one has heard of. But there's an amazing <laughs> thing which my brother, little link which my brother Roger sent me a couple of days ago to a program that went out with Billy Connolly um, talking about how influenced he was by the Incredible String Band. And I was w watching this clip last night. So it all goes back to those early days. And even before that, childhood influences in London. I used to dig ponds in our gardens. We went on childhood holidays in the Hebrides and Devon and Cornwall. And I would say my early influences as an urban child were nature and ecosystems, ponds particularly, and this kind of marvel of seeing nature working in balance. And I think I took that back to the land with a group of six people when we moved to our farm in West Wales in 1973, having uh, done a course at Emerson College for about a year, uh, in Forest Row learning biodynamic agriculture because really because it was the only organic farming course at the time and then worked on quite an intensive dairy farm in Hampshire for a year having just wanted to train up before we actually uh, had our own farm and um, yes yes Martin yes that's one of the incredible <laughs> string band songs so um, <laughs> So there are some people that are old enough to know what the hell I'm talking about. But in a way, the point about that time was there was a lot of burning idealism and you, also an atmosphere that you should just do anything. If you wanted to do it, you should just do it. And so we did it and doing it was buying a 135 acre farm in West Wales, uh, buying a herd of Foundation Ayrshire cows, 22 of which came from Scotland and the other eight from West Sussex, uh, from a herd which doesn't any longer exist. They were the foundation herd of the cows that we still milk today. Today, the farm is 300 acres, more or less, mostly rented. Well, more than half is rented. Uh, we have 80 cows, plus all the followers, including the male calves. We're making the single farm cheese from the milk and maturing it for about a year, raw milk, um, and it's called Habod. And it's uh, reassuringly expensive, which means it's out of reach of supermarkets. We can discuss why that is. And we're now selling ruby veal from the male calves as well. 
and we're trying to do the whole thing in harmony with nature. Uh, along the road, I was very involved with the development of um, the organic, early organic movement in the UK, well, the very early organic movement, that was Lady E. Balfour back in the uh, 40s, but um, the second wave of it, which was really the, set, the 70s, um, and I was co-founded an organization called British Organic Farmers, and its sister organization, the Organic Growers Association, that was in the early 80s. And then that sort of merged with the Soil Association in the 90s. And then I was, um, um, I was uh, headed up the Soil Association between 95 and 2010, after which I then set up the Sustainable Food Trust. I mean, there's a lot to talk about there. Obviously, I don't know what would interest people or what would, it, would interest you. I mean, obviously we farmed organically from the start. That's probably worth saying. But I think the whole organic thing has been slightly misunderstood because in our kind of burning idealism at the time, what we wanted to do was to farm in a, in a sustainable and, although the world wasn't out there, then regenerative way. Yeah. In other words, we wanted to farm in harmony with nature. We wanted to produce food without chemicals and without sort of violating nature. We didn't know what we were doing that much. So we learned as we went. And then we realized quite quickly that you couldn't make a living doing that because the prices we needed to charge to make our products viable were higher than the standard market because this was in the days of the milk marketing board so we for many years sold all our milk to the milk marketing board and then it was um, as it were privatized by margaret thatcher uh, then we then various co-ops and it was a long time before we had an organic premium so we had this bright idea of writing down the principles of sustainable agriculture more or less on the on the back of an envelope at that time and then developing a market based on those principles. They were the organic standards. It was, a, it was the whole organic project was trying to make economic sense of what wasn't economic if you didn't charge a premium. But the underlying impulse was to farm in a sustainable way. And here we are now in a, you know, Elms, brexit -y, covid -y time. And I think now we can see that whereas then we were trying to develop a market which was separate from conventional agriculture, uh, now we need to change all farming because otherwise we won't have a livable planet. There you are, I'll stop there. That was a bit of a rant. Yeah, no, Patrick, it's absolutely brilliant to hear. And so I'm really curious about the very early days of when you bought the farm and just like, what was it as the six of you walked on the farm for the first day? Obviously you had to go and get the cows and you, did, you had the training, but yeah, what were the first few things you put in place as you tried to take this farm forward and actually start to, you know, get it productive? Well, it was incredibly run down. So it was kind of organic by default. Uh, probably yeah. not quite actually. I think Mrs. Eaton, who's a Yorkshire woman who owned it before, put a little bit of fertilizer on just before we arrived because she was worried that it looked too, you know, <laughs> threadbare. Um, so we bought this foundation, heard there were no fences. The half the farm was really boggy. Uh, there were no habitable buildings, including the house. <laughs> but there were six <laughs> of us living in, in our commune. So there, that, that precipitated social strains, let's put it like that way. Yeah. So the commune gradually disintegrated. It took about 18 months. And then eventually, um, we were, my, me and my first wife and our kids were left there uh, on our own. And actually the farm was put on the market because the couple who, whose family bought the farm, they were wealthy estate agents, London estate agents, Donaldsons. And uh, the, so they bought the farm. Then when this couple who were the, you know who owned it whose family owned it left the farm was put on the market so there were several chapters of the farm um and chapter one ended when the commune dissolved chapter two started when a chap who was working on the farm as a volunteer called nick rebeck whose sister i was at emerson with um offered to buy it because he'd had an inheritance from his grandfather so i was then a tenant for another 15 years but i put, i always thought the farm was like mine you know, I didn't yeah. really think of it as, it, it was sort of God's farm. I was a steward of it. And the fact that it was owned by somebody else didn't really matter. So we just, you know, improved it. And at the time there were big capital EU grants available, the Farm and Horticultural Development Scheme. So we put up loads of buildings. We drained the bog as we called it. Uh, we put in water, et cetera, et cetera. And then also learned how to farm with us as we were going along. We grew carrots, we grew, wheat for milling and selling in the local Aberystwyth Whole Food store. And in many ways, the things we did in the earlier days are the things which I hope will become much more normal today. Um, then we went into a sort of more 
cattle-only period where it was just milk for a while because we, we grew carrots for 26 years and sold them to the supermarkets until the pack houses moved to the eastern counties and we couldn't do it any longer, so we gave up. Um, and now we're kind of at the, on the threshold of diversifying again. First of all, we diversified in 2000, 2006. We started making cheese, and that's really been a huge success, uh, despite COVID, interestingly enough. Uh, but I think we could diversify further, but it just depends what happens. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen now. That's the fascinating thing. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, and what, what I find interesting about this is kind of the original vision you had when you took on the farm back in the day. It still feels like that's very, like, alive inside the farming that you're doing today. It's like nothing has really changed. You're still there to be an exemplar, to show a new way, to actually start to, you know, demonstrate how farming can really work in harmony with nature. I was wondering... I think like, that's true. Yeah. I think... Yeah. You know, the place has, an, has a vitality about it. And also, I'm, I'm a great fan of the poet John O'Donoghue, who died, unfortunately, about eight years ago, I think it was maybe 10 years ago, who said that landscape held cultural memoria. It had, it's a kind of silent witness to everything that happens on it, but it holds the memories of what happened and the energy of what happened. And when you, when you come on our farm today, it feels quite, you know, alive. And also, we planted trees in the 70s, and they're really huge today, which is completely yeah. fascinating. You have, to, you have to live a while to see how quickly a tree can grow. There's lots yeah. of things like that. Also, I know where all the drainage, we've drained the whole farm, not the whole farm, not only the wet bits, but I know where all the drains are. There's a kind of, you know, one's got all this stuff, which is the kind of, you know, knowledge of the thing, which the organism, which your ecosystem, that's what it is. A farm is an ecosystem. It's like a cell of the food system. And I believe it is a mi microcosm, macrocosm thing. If you can have a healthy farm, you can have a healthy food system. A lot of the farms, through no fault of the farmers, have become unhealthy because yeah. the stimuli have been to use chemicals and to specialise and intensify. And that's made the farms unhealthy. But you can very quickly, I think, nurse a farm back to health if you change your methods. Yeah, brilliant. And actually, Patrick, could you say a bit more about that? So... Um, clearly that your farm is very much uh, an exemplar of how farming with nature really can work. And I guess those farms that have nat naturally kind of transitioned away from organics or, you know, are using chemicals. I mean, how would you say that you can start to rebuild the spirit of a farm and, and the community of a farm? And, and, and you know, what, what kind of would you, from what you've learned, what would you sort of say might be the way that people could start to, yeah, farm in harmony with nature and actually kind of create, the, bring the spirit back to life again, I guess? Well, I think the microbiome is a fascinating un unfolding, a magical unfolding of a new understanding of our relationship with nature. Because the whole thing, in a way, is uh, about these interdependent symbiotic relationships, whether it's you know, inside our own stomachs, uh, in the soil, which is really the stomach of all plants. Think of it like that. Um, in our cheese store, which is another microbiome, which has a kind of unique ecology to it. And if you're producing a raw milk cheese, then every day the milk has its own microbiome of bacteria, which are hopefully friendly bacteria. Um, otherwise, the EHO might have something to say. Uh, <laughs> a, we, we all live in fear of EHOs, I think, because they, they have a constitutional fear of bacteria, which, as my friend Richard Young once said, bacteria will have the last laugh. And uh, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's all about working with these ecosystems, large and small, starting to have a feel of a field for instance in a different way so what one is doing it seems to me as a farmer is trying to enliven the ecology of the soil in the field by a combination of management practices crop rotation if you have one but if you don't have one if you if it's just permanent grassland which about half of our farm is in permanent grassland it's all the things that you do and don't do and the timing of them and just to give an example of that We've always kind of, in a fairly haphazard way, done rotational grazing because we've got fields and we, took, we rotate the cows around them. But this work of Alan Savory and Joel Salatin and Gabe Brown and others on holistic grazing management has been, for me, a real eye-opener because I've understood that intensively grazing uh, animals and then moving them on is the key, I think, to increasing grassland pro productivity, but also probably diversity and also soil building. So I think we can speed up soil building 
by adopting holistic management practices. And it's taken me, you know, we're, we're 47 years in, and it's only in the last couple of years that I've realized that we, we're only at the beginning of what we can do with building soil and improving our grassland productivity. I don't think you ever stop learning when you're farming. It's like every day is completely new and you can see fresh things. And I do feel that it's like that at the moment in farming. We're at the beginning of a new chapter. So I think there's so much to learn, but also a lot of it is also known by people a long time ago, like Sir Albert Howard, this guy who was a, you know, kind of establishment figure sent out to India by the British government at the turn of the last century to teach the peasant farmers in Northwest India to adopt Western methods, which were really beginning to intensify. And he had the wisdom and the humility to see that the farmers he encountered knew more than he did about truly sustainable farming. And he wrote this book, when he spent 35 years in India, he wrote this book called An Agricultural Testament, which was published in 1940 when he got back. It's all in there, you know, he, saw, he had all the observations about working in harmony with nature, how the soil and the management of the soil, the return of, of manures and the crop, all the things that we're now calling regenerative agriculture, he saw them then. So I think there's a lot to learn from the past, but I think we have to apply it in a new context. Amazing, Patrick. And I was just wondering, with that, I mean, could you um, could you start to share a little bit about the Sustainable Food Trust and, and what you're doing at the Sustainable Food Trust and, and maybe just touch on a little bit about how you're endeavouring to push this agenda forward and create more story, more voice around it so it is more accessible to other people? Well, I think um, the, the last years of the Soil Association leading up to 2010, the organic project was you know, going well, if you'd see it that way, but we were still only, and even today, it's, it's interesting that the total organic market is steady about something like 2% of the food market. Yeah. And um, I think I felt right from the beginning that I didn't really want it. And I'm blaming myself to a degree, because I mean, after all, I was one of the architects of this whole framework, that, as I described, that the organic market was seen by people in the wrong way, you know, seen as niche and expensive and not necessarily better for you because Krebs said it wasn't and things like that, you know. And I think what I always wanted was to be much more integrated with the whole of the farming community. I didn't want to have polls and, you know, either you are organic or you're not. It was all part of a bigger, bigger vision, really. So with the Sustainable Food Trust, which is still a very small organisation, maybe 13 or 14 people, the idea was to create a, um, a catalyst, nothing, nothing more than that. We don't want to get into certification or anything like that uh, and delivery. That, there are plenty of other organizations out there doing that, but just to be a sort of um, a, an incubator of new thinking and a catalyst for spreading it uh, to bring in new ideas and thinking, which hopefully would then help the much needed transition to um regenerative farming systems not just in the uk but internationally and that's our mission accelerate the transition and our practices are we're working on a few reports like the moment we're working a report on what we would eat if the whole country was farmed in a sustainable way because you know various reports like eat lancet have come up with it with what in my opinion are completely wrong understandings of what a sustainable diet would look like very anti-ruminants due to a fundamental lack of understanding of agriculture and ruminants, in my opinion, and soil building. Um, and we want to counter some of that by looking at the food output of a, UK, a sustainably farmed UK, and then that, divide that by the number of people in the country and see what that diet would look like. And that's quite, weirdly enough, that's quite orthodoxy challenging. So, you know, we're all doing another report on Beyond Roundup, because we think, you know, I don't know if anybody heard the podcast I did last week with Zach Bush who's this medic in Virginia I mean just staggering what he is saying he's basically saying that we're poisoning ourselves and the planet with herbicides and you know a lot of farmers are dependent on run up and think it's safe so those sorts of things we want to be a catalyst for change and perhaps our biggest project is measuring on-farm sustainability uh, that we are really working hard on the idea being that we had, I was at a farmers meeting about five years ago, and it was a kind of note comparison session where everybody was saying, well, how many audits do you have? And typically we're all subject to multiple annual audits. In my case, two for the Soil Association, one for the farmer, one for the cheese, and then there's Red Tractor, 
then there's a Welsh government want data and then because we're making cheese we have salsa and BRC all this god knows what all of them charge ridiculous amounts of money and take up much too much time and an absolute ordeal and most of them are just looking to see if we're cheating and none of them which is fair enough but none of them tell me whether my soil carbon content my biodiversity my water purity my emissions are better or worse than last year and we found this group of farmers in lots of different shades of intensity that we all were feeling the same way about it we thought well why don't we co-design the audit that we would like to be participants in which would tell us what we want to know so if you fast forward five years to today We've got a kind of framework of categories and metrics. And just to give an example, you know, what would we measure if we wanted to measure our soil health, which normal farmers could measure, not, you know, weird farmers who've got lots of tech and can do extraordinary things, but just normal measurements. We came up with three metrics for each of 10 categories. And the soil would be organic matter, uh, water, filter, water permeability, you know, the speed at which water infiltrates down through soil, just through the drain pipe test and an earthworm count. And then you can have more detailed stuff. And then we're still working on some of the metrics like biodiversity, what you measure, do you measure bats? Do you have pasture content? That's a discussion. But we've got a framework, we've got high level metrics. And interestingly, just about everyone agrees this is needed. So we had a meeting last week. We had 38 participants, four supermarkets, Henry Dimbleby, Minette Batters, um, RAP, all the key institutions were around the table. No one disagrees that harmonization is not a good idea. And we're also working in other countries. So we're working in Australia, working in America, where we've got a, a sort of nascent project in Africa. I don't see any reason why the UK couldn't be a lead organization, a lead country rather, in bringing an organizational collaboration together to make this an international framework. And then we could have like a Paris Agreement for food. So we could have, you know, we could say, look, trade in food is good as long as it's not to standards which are causing uh, climate change. So you could have tariff free trade as long as it was regenerative. And then you could charge people if they're causing damage. And that would be a fabulous sort of inspirational platform for trade instead of the very depressing chlorinated chicken conversation we're having. And I think there's real momentum there. Patrick, that's, so what do you think needs to happen um, now to start to it kind of embed this idea of, of the kind of sustainability metrics. I've Because I've been to a few of the, the, the workshops that you guys have done and it feels that ca capturing these metrics is a really fundamental thing of running a well organized farm because you're, you're yeah. measuring all the key dependencies that are your productivity, your profit, everything like that, you know, through soil and livestock management and, and performance. Um, how do you see the, the, the these metrics supporting the everyday farmer in a really tangible way, just as a course of normal business? Well, imagine this is a real possibility that the Welsh government said, uh, when they launched their new sustainable farming scheme, which cross fingers is gonna be really good, because in my opinion, it's on the issue about how the single farm and payment is reallocated, you know, when all the, when death together. I think the most desirable outcome would be if you take, just say, let's, let's say it's a hundred pounds an acre or whatever your currency is. Um, if most of that money was available on condition that the farmer or land manager adopted a whole farm systemic approach towards regenerative type farming and the condition of entry into that scheme was an annual sustainability audit roughly based on the framework of categories and metrics that I just described then the Welsh government would start collecting baseline data so for instance you know if, if let's say most farmers went into the scheme because they would because they wouldn't they want 100 pounds an acre or whatever it would be um, then immediately you'd start collecting data about soils on every field in Wales potentially on grassland biodiversity on emissions on everything and that's what everyone needs now we you know if we're going to go net zero to you know by 2040 if you follow the nfu line then unless we've got the data about our carbon we won't know but it isn't just carbon it's about biodiversity it's about water quality it's about social and cultural impacts so if all the farms were collecting that data how great that would be and i think that because governments tend to be slow 
it's quite possible that supermarkets might start using this framework in advance of that, or the investment community. So for mm -hmm. instance, uh, in our newsletter, a couple of weeks ago, we had this announcement about a deal that had done, been done with some Australian grassland farmers and Microsoft. It's basically yeah. an offsetting deal. But this, these farms, which I actually visited in New South Wales, had built carbon way above the 0.4 per thousand that the French minister Stephen de Foll set at the COP21. Um, and they would verified it in ways which seem to be good. I mean, you know, the whole thing about how we measure soil carbon is a big issue, as everyone knows. But imagine farmers being paid as soil carbon stewards. For that, we need a harmonised way of measuring soil. And we need the same kind of approach to all the other sustainability impacts. That's what the golden opportunity is. And we've also got Morrison's and NatWest Bank and one or two others already trialling these, these um, kind of framework of farm sustainability uh, assessment framework, including one, being one in one of the DEFRA tests and trials. So I think if, if a farmer wanted to get involved, uh, make contact with us, uh, because I think the more the merrier. And there's a small question of how we uh, pay for these um, individual farm trials, but they're not that expensive. And it's quite possible that there are people out there who would pay for them. Patrick, this is absolutely amazing. And just a question on this, um, is the whole natural capital market, this transition of, you say, Microsoft or, or other corporates investing in carbon offsetting back to farms, do you feel this might be a prerequisite for them to have that kind of data? I, they won't make their X amount of £100,000 available to the market unless farmers are capturing, again, it is above, it's above and beyond carbon, isn't it? Because the biodiversity, people care about that. The water quality, people care about that. So it kind of feels like this market of natural capital, these billions of pounds potentially, aren't going to come into farmers' pockets until these sort of metrics are being measured. I think that's completely true. And if, I mean, whether your income is going to come from selling your food or from deals with the private sector, people who want to you know, invest in sustainable farming or do offsets and stuff like that, or whether it's going to come from governments, I think for us to, you know, make, to benefit as much as we can, from the way in which we are building natural and human capital, uh, we need to measure it. So I think measuring really is a prerequisite for taking best advantage of all the things, all the services and the goods uh, that our farms can deliver. So we've been part of the problem through no fault of anyone except everyone. Uh, and we can absolutely be part of the solution now. Uh, I mean, and it really sounds like, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? You know, so naturally That's you're going to let things slip. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. 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 Perfect, Patrick. That's brilliant. Well, that's, I mean, what an amazing start. And I mean, we could talk for hours about this and I've got so many questions I'd love to ask, but just in the respect of time, um, I think we should move on to the next section. And Patrick, the next section really is, um, so we've obviously got our family farm here and, and, um, we're 90 acres just south of Guildford in Surrey, and we're looking to work out how we transition. And I was just wondering, do you have any advice for the everyday farmer, you know, really practical, tangible things that we could do today, whether it is engaging with the sustainability metrics and actually undertaking, you know, that, or yeah, what advice do you have for the everyday farmer just to get ready now um, for the new markets? Well, you know, I would say this is an unstoppable transition which is taking place. It, you know, one could get depressed uh, if one talks to some people in DEFRA, because I'm not sure that they get it yet. But, yeah. you know, th this change is coming. And so I think whether the government wake up to it sooner or later, uh, how well informed the public are acting as food buyers, uh, or whether all the other agencies come behind, I think farming in harmony with nature, um, producing as much food for those of us who don't want to rewild, and I'm not one of the rewilders. I mean, I'm not against, re how could you be against rewilding? But I want to, I want, I want to produce food first and foremost. Yeah. So if you want to produce, I think the, the, the challenge for us all now is to produce as much food as we can, which is consistent with being a steward of the capital under our management, natural, yeah. human, everything. And I think that we're all in this together. I don't think, you know, you're farming or might want to farm 90 acres near Guildford. Um, and I'm farming, you know, two, 300 boggy acres in West Wales. We're united by our common stewardship of the land, the soil, 
nature and trying to keep the planet habitable. And I think there needs to be that feeling. And so I think each farm is unique, but at the same time, there are so many characteristics of all farms which are common, like you know, we're all looking after soil, water, more or less, biodiversity, microbiomes, ecosystems, and the person, the human being is part of this system. That's what Rudolf Steiner said. Uh, I think that was really important that you can't separate the person who's looking after the farm from the, from, we are part of nature actually. We are nature yeah. and what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. So we need to produce food and water from our farms that we would drink and we would eat and would enhance our health. And that's the collective responsibility of all farmers today. And we can do this. And supermarkets have become part of this commodity slavery in a funny sort of way. They're slaves themselves, you know, sacrificing everyone on the altar of cheap food when it isn't really cheap at all. And, you know, I think it's, I just think we should take heart. Don't become, don't perpetuate the commodity slavery, which we hopefully going to emerge from now. It's going nowhere. And there are a lot of challenges, like, you know, a lot of farmers may be watching this or using Roundup. So how do we manage to manage our farms without Roundup, for instance? Yeah. Which is what we'll have to do. it get banned, I'm sure. It's only a matter of time. So, Patrick, I mean, is there a piece <clears throat> so on our farm? Do you feel that there's a value in, in kind of having a much closer connection to our consumers or the people we're selling to and, and kind of just the local people within the villages and towns around here? Yes. In, yeah. Yes, of course, because like our milk, let, let's say the organic price is 40 pence a litre. It's probably less than that at the moment. Making it into cheese, it, the, we, we triple the value of the milk. So I think... Yeah you know, vertically integrating and developing local markets. I think post COVID, a lot more people are going to want to buy local food. So I think there's an opportunity there to, you know, add value, cut out people in the chain. Not all farmers want to do that. So maybe they had to form collaborative partnerships with other farms in their area. But one way or the other, I think it's, a, it's about provenance and it's about retaining the story behind the food right to the person who buys it. And if it's remote and you don't actually know the farm, one of the things we were thinking about with this sustainability metric is that you could have a score on it. So, you know, let's say the score, total score is 100. If I had perfect scores on carbon, soil, water, emissions, energy and resources, all our categories, then I, that score could be on our cheese or whatever yeah. it was. And then and you could and also it would mean abandoning the organic label, but you could combine it with a score, for instance. And so perfect. I think, yes, add value. <clears throat> on the farm you're on, build a network of committed customer relationships, whether it's box schemes or CSA. I mean, there are so many different ways of doing it. Uh, and they will be unique to the particular farm and who, what, what resources you've got. Brilliant. Brilliant, Patrick. Well, that's fantastic. Thank, thank you for that. And yeah, I can really see, I mean, it is really just being, yeah, as you say, a custodian of the land or a steward of the land, right? You know, we are here to protect and enhance it and as well as the local community. Uh, if we can't, you know, that's, that really is what we're here for. And that I think is, you know, a very exciting vision to, to, to kind of move into. Um, we're, all next... part of, we're all part of a sort of vast ecosystem and we're yes. the cells in it in a funny sort of way. And it's not all positive, you know, I mean, as we can see in the world at the moment, there's, there's disharmony as well as harmony in the world, but somehow we just have to work through that. Yeah, perfect. I mean, it's sort of be the change you wish to see in the world, isn't it? I guess it's sort mm. of a bit like mm. that. So Patrick, that's brilliant, thank you. And the next question I've got is, you know, given the massive changing times, especially in the UK, you know, coming out of the basic payment scheme and, you know, diminishing payments and transition into ELMS, whatever form that's going to take, and the natural capital market, um, we've probably touched on this a little bit, but what do you think needs to be put in place for the UK to really become the exemplar as to how land can and should be managed? You've touched on it a bit, but have you got any more thoughts that you could add to that? Well, I do think we have to make it profitable to farm in the ways that we've been discussing. At the moment, it, there hasn't been a business case in the past, unless you're an entrepreneur or you've got no debt or you've got a day job like me, you know, it hasn't been possible for the sort of farming that we're talking about, building, rebuilding all the capital that we've uh, mined during my farming lifetime, uh, hasn't paid as well as farming, which is destructive. So I do think that governments need to, you know, play their part. And I think there's a massive need for public understanding, awareness building. And I, it's rather unfortunate that all these recent reports, which have said we've got to go to a plant-based diet, um, when in fact, the right kind of animals 
are absolutely central to regenerative farming systems, particularly in the UK, where two thirds of all the land is pasture anyway, and it might even be more than that if we go regenerative. So we have to, we, there's a huge, it doesn't, I don't mean this in a patronizing way, but there's a massive education job to do. And mm. I think there are some people like, just to give call one out, the Climate Change Committee, I don't know if anybody's been watching their vision, if you can call it that, for UK agriculture, but it's disastrous. So I'm not saying that there's any malevolent reason for this. It's just I don't think the people who wrote the plan understand agriculture. So to give an example, the Climate Change recommend Committee's recommendations for UK agriculture, including Wales, I've watched two of these seminars, presumes no build in soil carbon. And when you ask them why, which I, of course I did, I was irritating on the chat, you know, tried to intervene and all that sort of stuff. Um, they said, well, it's because uh, we're going to sustainably intensify on the best land, so there won't be any carbon gain there. And then they sign up to this orthodoxy that on the grassland, carbon plateaus after 20 years and you get no more gain. Well, there's a lot of agricultural grassland scientists who sign up to that, but I think there are a growing number of us that know that that isn't right. So there's a lot of work to do to re-educate, not just the public, but some of these august bodies who tell us what we should eat and I think are sending out the wrong messages. And on that, on that, on that re-education, Patrick, what form do you think that is? Is that in-person workshops, you know, when we can? Is it online events? Is it these sort of things? Is it some form of documentary? What do you think would really help educate the masses on this conversation? Well, I think, you know, David Attenborough would be a good example. He's an amazing man. And what a communicator. When he did his Instagram the other day, it had six million in about two minutes or something. Uh, but the thing is, I think he's been uh, wrongly advised because if anybody's watched that Netflix extinction yeah. documentary right at the end he says you know don't worry we can fix this and i'll tell you how something like that and he goes through all these things we could do regenerative energy and stuff like that then he comes to food and he says we should do what the dutch have done and you know vertical farming and effectively he's kind of advocating sustainable intensification so we can rewild as much land as possible i just think he's wrong I, yeah. and funnily enough I sent, I, I, uh, because I, I've got a friend who knows him and I have met him once, uh, this is about 10 years ago, uh, no, actually longer than that, nearly 20 years ago, I met him and I actually had dinner with him. And so I sent him a little note saying, would you be prepared to talk to me about this in a podcast or something like that? And he sent me a charming handwritten note back saying, I don't know enough. You know, I'm, mm. I'm flattered you should ask. Well, the thing is, imagine if David Attenborough did know enough and he started putting out the right messages. That would be massive. Um, so I think it's it's harnessing the power of all the existing commentators and media people and uh, national treasures to get behind this. And at the moment, people like Eat, Eat Lancet and I mentioned Climate Change Committee. Some of these reports, it's not. I don't. I think they're all incredibly well intentioned, but basically they don't understand the issues, and that's a bit frightening. It's just an opinion. I mean, I know not everybody is going to agree with this, but that's what I think. <laughs> no, Patrick, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being so frank, as always. I, I think this is touching on a really important thing, though. I think even things like Kiss the Grounds, you know, the documentary that came out recently on Netflix, again, it really moves the agenda forward with the science that underpins it. And of course, you know, it's a documentary and we can't probe into the numbers maybe as we'd want to, but it feels like we might need to do something the same in the UK, like some form of documentary that really opens this conversation up. Um, and... Yeah, I, I just wonder whether that is something that we look to push forward with going forward, you know. I think it would be great if we could put together enough funding to make that happen. I mean, Kiss the Ground's a good example, then um, Holy Cow, so one yep. other one which has come out. But we need a UK version of these. And, you know, how great it would be if we could get some national treasure to narrate it who's got the reach that we need. And it's, a I mean, it could be some, you know, the Jamie Ollers of this world or, or the Hugh Fernley Watching Source. But I think the problem is that I'm not even blaming them, but the people who manage them are more interested in the brand of the people than they are on the issues sometimes, which is a bit depressing. Yeah, because what we hear a lot in, in Land Management 2.0, Patrick, is people want education and they want case studies. And I just don't think there's enough case studies that can really um, kind of give the confidence to the everyday land manager to transition to region ag off their own back. So I think whatever we could do to put some kind of documentary like that together would be absolutely yeah. fascinating. There might be one which is more aimed at farmers, which would be fine. Yeah. A lot of people, an old friend of mine, Mary Langman, who was used to be Lady Balfour's secretary, she always said, actually, the public are much more interested in farming than you think, as you see from Country Bell, which I think is 
pretty depressing, actually. It's like a chocolate box, a uh, distorted version of what the countryside's really like. But it just shows the number of people that are interested is incredible. But Country Farm misrepresents what's really going on in the country a lot of the time. And I've even talked to some of the people who are researchers in it, and they agree privately. So it was just so great if Country Farm could come behind all this. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, there's a little project for us to chat about at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant, Patrick. Well, I'm conscious of time and we could, as I said before, keep talking about this for ages because I have so many questions. Um, so, but we should transition on to Q&A now. Um, so I will do my best to try to, uh, yeah, to try to, to share what people have been asking. So, and if anyone else has any questions, please do feel free to, to um, add them into the q and I'll do my best to, to ask Patrick. So um, Julian asks, um, would you agree that sustainable regenerative agroecological farming systems must be as mixed and diverse as possible? And are there any metrics, uh, are there any metrics that must include meaningful measures of genetic diversity? Um, uh, da, 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 yeah, so could you say anything more about yes, that? Yes, I think both, uh, yes to both questions. And uh, I think enterprise diversity which paradoxically enough is probably hard on a very small holding or not, not necessarily, is critical. But I don't, you know, I mean, you, you could simplify it if you need to, but as to measuring diversity, I think it's critical. It's one of our metrics. So we've got, when it, when it comes to biodiversity, we've got agricultural biodiversity and we've got non-agricultural biodiversity. The agricultural biodiversity being the plants and the animals that you have on your holding and the non-agricultural biodiversity would be the biodiversity which can coexist with the farming system, not just around the edge, like they've got at Hope Farm, for instance, the RSPB place where it's all about kind of intensive arable production in the middle and then stewardship around the edges, which I think is absolutely the wrong way forward. So I think measuring this non-agricultural biodiversity uh, is, is, a, is possible. And that was one of the things I said earlier, is did, we haven't worked that out yet, but the agricultural biodiversity is critical. And by the way, just on the subject of gene editing, I gather that people like CIWF and even Guy Watson uh, are advocating gene editing. And he apparently said the other day that he thought gene editing was necessary for uh, control of blight and potatoes. Well, I don't see why. Frankly, I think gene editing is just moving further down the frightening narrowing of agricultural biodiversity. It's the last thing we want to do. We want to, as Rudolf Steiner said, breed from our own plants and animals like the land race thing with plant with uh, grains uh, because through epigenetic adaptation plants and animals will become adapted to the farm where we are so i think any sort of you know white heat of technology mapping of the genome designing plants so they can be this that and the other is actually misguided and i think we need you know this is consultation going on at the moment we really need to respond to that because there's a lot of people who think, as the Prime Minister said two days ago at the National Farmers Union Conference, don't worry, we can lead the world with our gene editing. God help us all. Yeah. Stanley wouldn't agree, by the way. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Um, very, con yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'd say I, there's a lot of questions in that as well, but we better move on to the next one. So Clive asks, um, do we need to be wary of getting too involved and dependent in the offsetting market, being rewarded, re rewarded for building natural capital? Yes, but selling offsets. Is there any worry about the offset market? I think there is a worry, but you know, there are a lot of people who think you can't monetize everything. But on the other hand, if we don't put a value on things, uh, then they're, they're, but almost by definition, they, they won't have a value. I think if everybody offsets everything, then we won't be making any progress. But on the other hand, I mean, if I, I you know, these targets for carbon, uh, net carbon, net zero emissions, and, you know, including in agriculture, to be honest, I think it's going to be very hard to um, produce all the food we eat in a net, net zero way, probably without some, quote, offsetting. So that might mean, you know, a forestation or I don't know. But I think offsetting is, it, it could be a part in the kind of landscape, but uh, it would be better to reward, to have a direct reward rather than just all think about offsetting. Now, I think it's an important question there because, you know, how much of our income is going to be uh, from selling food? How much is going to be from government through taxation? And how much is through 
other forms of investment and offsetting. I don't know what the ratio is and where are the boundaries? That's another interesting point. So, for instance, you know, on soil carbon, should the government pay for maintenance and the investment community pay for gain? I don't know what the answer is, but this, these are important questions. Brilliant. Um, just on an, uh, another uh, sort of angle. Um, so the, the cost of food for the consumer is likely to increase potentially with this, maybe not if we have the offsetting markets and government, you know, underpinning things. But what do you see is going to be the impact in consumers having to pay more for their food? Um, and yeah, just how, how the everyday consumer might interface with this kind of changing system towards more regenerative practice that may incur more costs for the consumer? Well, I'll just trot up answers that everyone's heard before. Like, you know, we, we only spend under 10% of our income on food today. It was 30% back in the 70s or whatever. And we're already paying for the food, the apparently cheap food, which isn't really cheap in hidden ways, like through uh, NHS treatment costs, which I think is a massive issue. You know, we're only beginning to realize how, to, how much direct connection there is between changes in farming practice and negative health outcomes. I think that really is enormous. And if we can mm. start to make causative links between cancers and food intolerances and all diabetes and all these things, I'm certain it's connected to the intensification of agriculture as well as just processing of food. So I think the truth is there will be a section of society, maybe 10, 20% for whom affordability of food is a big issue. And I just think we have to have a, a government intervention there, you know, whether it's food, green food stamps or whatever. But we, we have to pay the real cost of food. Let's not talk about whether it's more expensive or not. It's a, it, good food has a certain cost to it. A nutrient dense food is the right of everyone. It has a certain cost. Society has to pay for it. Either we pay for it or funnily enough, we offset it. And look what happens when we offset climate change if you see what I mean, because it, my, agriculture has just been a mining operation for most of the last 50 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Julian actually asks, says, uh, makes a really interesting point. You know, uh, I think you probably, we know what the answer is, but um, Julian asks, um, do you support the One Health approach, i.e. that human, animal, and the environment are all inextricably inextricably linked and interdependent do, do you see that we are we are clearly one independent internet interconnected system and therefore we can't have costs over here and expect to have cost savings here so yeah is there anything you could say about that as well i think that's deeply it's it's deeply and profoundly true um it's almost as if we have to come to a new understanding and awareness at a very deep level in ourselves of the fact that we are not separate from nature and yet, in some ways, as a potentially more evolved being, organism, that gives us stewardship responsibilities. But I think that's completely true, that we are not separate from nature. We are nature. Nature is in us. We are part of nature. Yes. Uh, and Paul actually asks a second question. With, do you see, I mean, how does this food labelling point uh, that come from the, potentially the metrics support this really properly accounting for the costs that we may not be accounting for in the actual food that we buy? Well, we got very much involved with true cost accounting, as it's now become known, uh, about 10 years ago. But we realised quite quickly when we got involved with that, that until you had a, a harmonised framework for measuring the impacts of agriculture, uh, any attempt to put to monetize it would be confusing. And so I do believe we did this report a couple of years ago, three years ago now, called The Hidden Costs of UK Food, where Richard Young, my colleague, tried to put a price on the hidden costs of food. And he came up with this amazing headline for every pound of food we buy in the shops, there's another pound in hidden costs, which we're not paying for. Well, we actually, we are paying for or we're deferring. And it's probably more than a pound. It's probably two pounds. Um, so we have to correct our dishonest economic system. And I think it's the reason why the economics of farming are wrong at the moment and dishonest, in fact, is because we don't have a proper balance sheet. The balance sheet is the balance sheet of nature. So in our new P&L, we have to, you know, produce food, yes, but we look at the balance sheet to make sure that we don't produce food at the cost of our soil fertility or our biodiversity or our emissions. And then it's a true um, you know, positive. That's real growth, isn't it? If a farm can maintain all its capitals and produce food, that's growth. That's, a, that's yeah. what we need. 
And that may touch on a point that Annabelle makes is there's a lot of pressure for land, you know, housing and infrastructure and things like that. And how do we, again, account for land value in a holistic way so that we're not just, you know, taking away great, you know, food production land to put houses on? Is there anything you can say about that, Patrick? Yeah, how do well, we, we account have, for the we value We had an land? interesting conversation with Savills and that, what do they call it? Um, I forgot the name now, where it says, you know, where if you're a tenant farmer and you have dilapidations, that's it. So dilapidations which is just looking to see if the buildings have gone down and stuff like that if dilapidations was expanded to being the the capital's balance sheet including soil biodiversity and everything you could do that if you had a harmonized sustainability audit and then that would add value to the land where it's got more of all those the, the, those um, bits of the natural and, and capital so yeah i think that's absolutely doable Brilliant. I wonder whether, so Martin asks an interesting question. How do we, if we can't measure something, maybe we don't know enough about it or we have no way of particularly measuring it, could that potentially skew the way that results end up coming out that we may not value what is important just because we've got no way of measuring it? I think that is true. And I mean, if you give one obvious example, animal welfare, you know, and yet funnily enough, because people care about animal welfare, that even though it's difficult to measure, we probably, or, you know, this, it's almost as if science is catching up with a new understanding of, if everything really is about the study of energy and the science that we have or had in the past is only measuring very physical and material things, but we're moving now in towards a more sort of metaphysical understanding uh, of stuff which we couldn't even measure before and were dismissed, things which were dismissed, which are in a way part of, part of the atmosphere of a farm, which I referred to earlier, is kind of, either depending on what your view is, magical. Well, what about the vitality of the soil or the vitality of nature? It's indescribable and indefinable, and yet weirdly enough, we're starting to be able to understand it. So I don't know what the answer to his question is, but it's a fascinating question. Brilliant. Well, I mean, I think maybe that's a good point to, to, to sort of start wrapping up, Patrick. I mean, this has been such a fascinating conversation and we've gone through so many different areas and subjects. And really I can hear what you're pointing at is we must start accounting for the whole cost benefit of everything that we're doing as human beings on this planet, because what future are we living into? That's, the, that's maybe the question that we should be asking ourselves. And it really sounds like what you're doing at the Sustainable Food Trust is really trying to get under the skin of the processes that allow us to really account for what the future can and should look like, especially as we start to utilize regenerative agriculture to start to you know, actually create a society that works. So have you got any last closing comments that you'd like to make, Patrick, on, yeah, uh, to wrap I it don't up? Know, just, I mean, Thank you very much for this conversation. I think there's, there's, there's cause for optimism. Uh, we, can't, we, cannot be, we cannot know what the uh, impact of our actions will be faced with you know, this apparently rather um, frightening situation we find ourselves in. But we have to make the, do the right thing anyway. And I believe that all right actions will have positive consequences. So I think if we are stewarding a little bit of planet Earth for our brief days, uh, before we hand the thing on to whoever's gonna follow us, uh, we have to strive as best we can to do everything good and positive. And there will be good consequences from those actions. Amazing. What a way to wrap it up. And Patrick, where can people find out more about the work that you're up to at the moment? Is there anywhere that people can go, websites, social channels? Um, well, do, do visit us, uh, do visit our website, Sustainable Food Trust, and sign up to our fortnightly newsletter and also podcasts. I mentioned the podcast with Alice, but last week I also mentioned was um, Zach Bush. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Um, and just look, there's, well, there's lots of information. Most of the stuff I've been talking about is one way or another accessible through our website and linked social media channels, etc. If you want to follow us on the farm Instagram, it's called Havod Cheese, H A F O D Cheese. Um, we post on that and uh, just, yeah, we'll get in touch. Yeah. Patrick Brilliant. at Sustainable Food Trust. 
Brilliant, Patrick. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. It's an absolute pleasure to chat. And yeah, I wish we could have spoken for another hour or two because it's just so much to talk about. So thank you so much for your time this morning. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Tim.